Hi everyone, welcome to another Coding Black Females event. Today we'll be joined by the amazing design team or the lead decision makers in the design team. <laughs> <laughs> Mary and Augustine from 8th Flight and we're also joined by Camille who is a talent acquisition and recruitment specialist at 8th Flight. We're also joined by the amazing Mariam from the Coding Black Females team so she'll be in the chat if you have any questions or just to smile and ask questions herself. So my name is Tanya Powell. I am the Code Chief Technology Officer here at Coding Black Females. If you haven't been to any of our events before, please come along, they're all amazing. You see me pop up every now and again. You see me pop up in every course at some point. Just I'll just show my face and answer questions for almost any topic that comes our way. And we have some amazing opportunities coming up over the next few months. We have got a few new courses coming our way. So we've got an entry level Java course. We've got a full bootcamp for that, that'd be across 30 weeks. That's running with UBS. We've got an intro to Java short course as well, that's starting in May. So if you want to dip your toe into some back end technology, that's the one for you. If you have taken a career break for whatever reason and you want to get back into the industry, we have our return to tech bootcamp starting in June. It's June, isn't it, Marion? June. Yep, starting in June. And if you just want to have some fun and you're based in London, we have got our next in-person Code and Chill on the 5th of April. We'll be at Makers in central London. And we're going to be talking about chat GPT and chilling and chatting and doing some coding all at the same time. So that's some of the things that we've got coming up at Coding Black Females over the next few months. I'm going to pass over to Camille to give you a little introduction to 8 Flight. Hi everyone, and thank you again for joining us on your Friday evening. Um, we're so happy to be here as a part of 8th Light. Um, we have a relationship with Coding Black Females um, in that we have some former 8th Light that are a part of your population. Um, just to share with you some details on what we do. Uh, we're a software consultancy uh, based mainly in the Midwest, started in about 2006. Uh, we have a history in the London and UK area that dates back to about several years now. Uh, but essentially as an organization, what we do focus on is bringing a higher level of quality, uh, performance, scalability and maintainability to the code and the product of our clients. Uh, so we are pretty agnostic with who we partner with. We're tech agnostic, meaning that we use a number of different technologies. You can find us in different environments. Uh, we even have government contracts in some cases, um, but we are looking for talent continuously and specifically people who can uh, bring that level and love of quality products, teaching and mentoring uh, to the work that you're doing. And so it's actually a really proud moment for us to have Augustine and Mary here who are going to talk about their approach specifically as we've grown our design practice in the last two, two to three years. Uh, and they're going to be focusing on human-centered design and how you as uh, developers or technologists can partner with design folks. So I won't detail any more spoilers. I'll let the people who are experts talk about it. But so nice to have you all. Thanks for letting us join. Thank you, Camille. So at the end of the presentation tonight, there'll be some time for questions and answers. Do not think you have to wait until that time to say what your questions are. Feel free to put them in the chat. And if you want, I'm more than happy to read them out at the end. But don't wait until that moment because you might forget. Just as soon as a question comes to you, put it in the chat and we can ask them all at the end. Augustine, Mary, are you both ready? Ready. Do you have access to share your screen? Mm -hmm. Amazing. It's over to the two of you. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, Tanya. And uh, we're so excited to be here. Um, we love to talk design. Um, as designers, we're also really interested in learning about th new things and curiosity is probably our number one um, trait. And so we welcome all, every and all questions, sharing of experiences, because we're here as much to learn from all of you as we are to uh, talk about what we do. Um, and we will have an activity uh, near the 
end of our talk to kind of wake everyone up and um, get collaboration going. So in our time with you today, we're going to explore, um, you know, that partnership between software developers and designers and how we can work together to really make exceptional products. And uh, Camille covered, you know, who we are at 8 Flight. I don't want to spend too much time repeating that. We are a global team. Um, as Camille said, we're um, a large number of us are based in the Midwest. I'm near Milwaukee. Uh, Augustine has the good fortune to live in Miami. So he gives us the snow report uh, every day for Miami. Um, but we, we focus on design development, uh, organizational design, which I'll get to in a moment. Next slide. So, um, you know, really, our, this is our tagline, and you'll notice the word human is in here. We really do put the human at center stage of what we do through human-centered design. It's worthwhile to mention that we're building our design practice. Uh, so I'm relatively new. Uh, same with Augustine, come with a lot of experience, both consulting and uh, independent companies, whether startup or Fortune 500. So we may share common ground uh, with act the actual companies you work at. So, um, Please do share that too, uh, any, any war stories or things like that. We're uh, very interested in hearing that. Um, if you go to the next slide, Augustine. So these are three um, kind of pillars of the way we approach software uh, products. Uh, we design for people, we've mentioned, Camille mentioned, I've mentioned that human-centered design approach. You know, we really want to ground our products in the lives that people live, whether it be work, play, combination. So uh, we'll talk about some of the techniques that designers use to learn about people and ground products in their lived experiences. We uh, are really focused on education, education, educating one another, educating clients, and uh, gaining education ourselves. Uh, we, we have a real focus on uh, creation and innovation and building our skills uh, to be current and leading. Uh, different disciplines. Uh, one I can think of is Web3. We have a practice around that um, and have done talks and such in that area. And then we're, we're always looking to um, develop clients as well. So we want to make sure that uh, when we collaborate with our clients, we empower them to take the work forward. Uh, we have some long-term clients, some shorter ones. Um, and the way I think about this as well, these three pillars, is this need not be a consultancy. I think, you know, all of these are great practices for, um, you know, small to large organizations, putting the human first, um, making sure we're all as, great as we can be by teaching and learning, which is what we're doing today. And then uh, really empowering each other to uh, enjoy success. So if we go to the next slide. <clears throat> so a little bit about our capabilities. Um, so we do focus on software. Um, so we talked about helping clients, you know, not only in delivering code, but also uh, moving as far upstream or left to think about 
before we write a line of code, what is the problem space and what are the, the goals users have? So the designed experiences, to, so taking, uh, and you might even switch these. Um, so taking ideas and insights and then implementing those through iter iterative development, often using uh, the agile development process. Um, we also look at organizational development. We have an internal apprentice program, uh, which we could send more information about after the session, if that's of interest. But we, we hire people who may be making a career change, uh, may already be in technology, and kind of teach them good software practices. We're looking to do that in design as well. And you get paid to learn, essentially, which is a, a really neat concept. It's one of the reasons I joined the company, because I love that uh, philosophy so much. Um, and then, you know, we're really looking at helping organizations, whether they be for-profit or non-profit, understand how to leverage technology to further their goals. You know, not every problem deserves or requires a digital um, solution, but actually in design, we have ways, uh, it's called service design, um, and we'll say a little bit more about that later, but looking at a whole customer experience, like if you walk into a bank, would be an example, who are people you talk to, what systems you use, how the bank itself is designed. So uh, we also use techniques in design to look at where it would be uh, appropriate to use technology for people who are solving customer problems and delighting customers. So if you go to the next slide, Augustine. So human-centered design uh, is what Augustine and I do. And um, there's a, a wide array of practices and philosophies in human-centered design. As you see on the slide, we're really looking at what is the problem space? What is the lived experience of people? And uncovering uh, information about that by talking to people, watching people, um, you know, learning what tools they use and the challenges they're having. Uh, looking at goals outside of using software, the question we ask is, how is the software supporting uh, the work or the life they want to live uh, or do? Um, and we, we spend a fair amount of time off the screen um, before we turn lived experiences into digital experience in understanding the lived experience. And that can be quite new for clients or for development organizations to set aside uh, a piece of the plan and produce assets that show workflows and personas and the like and demonstrating the value of those. So UI design follows from that really important uh, discovery work. Um, we also uh, focus on visual design, uh, branding, uh, UI implementation as well. Um, so our team, Augustine is a visual designer and brings a lot of uh, talent and perspective to our uh, product engagements, our, actually our web presence, and really that idea of communicating ideas and you know, facilitating movement throughout a product. Um, and also UI implementation, we really um, 
we do have hybrids on our team that are skilled in both design and implementation. So that comes in quite handy. Um, and especially, you know, one of the things we look at is feasibility of our design. So they become uh, a trusted source of what's possible. And finally, this isn't on the slide, but we do look at accessibility. So uh, people with differing uh, abilities, whether it be physical or cognitive being some examples, we think about how to design products that are inclusive uh, for people who um, may have challenges, for example, seeing, hearing would be some pretty tangible examples. So I know you're collecting questions over time. So uh, we'll do questions at the end, um, but please do post those in the chat. Um, a major kind of core to our design work is um, design thinking. And um, this is a, an approach to design. Um, there are a lot of different models that we can use to think about um, the characteristics of a good design and a good design process. This is one of them. Uh, and a, this is a good one. Um, and it was um, developed at the Stanford Design School, which is a very well-known school and made popular by IDEO, um, which is a worldwide um, top tier design company. So it's, it's well-researched and documented. And the three things we think about when we use the design thinking framework are desirability, feasibility, and viability. So when we look at desirability, you might consider this the hallmark of what we think about when we think about design. Not only is it useful, does it work, but also is it delightful? And all those things work together to say, this is a useful product. Um, I can use it to accomplish my goals. And it brings literally joy to what I do. And it need not, that could be a spreadsheet, right? It need not be, you know, a lot of people say like, can you make this pretty or sexy or um, nice, colorful? And all those things feed into desirability, but it's really about that, there's a famous quote um, from one of the leaders um, in design, Susan Dre, that says, if the user can't use it, it's not usable. So if you kind of think about that, um, I think that's kind of a, a good kind of accessible uh, way to, to describe and to understand uh, what human-centered design is. Uh, feasibility, and this is my favorite part of design um, and maybe near and dear to all of you is uh, when we look at a design idea and we think about um, what users need when they need it, um, designers, can dive deep. And I think this is, a, you know, a lot of uh, what, what people don't think of when they think of design. So we look at things like data models. Um, we think about APIs uh, and what data we need access to in order to serve uh, the user and their goals. Um, we can think about, um, you know, the business logic and think about rules that govern um, how the software should work and then making those visible. 
Um, so we can talk more about that. Um, it, it can be um, something where designers will sit in on technical architecture meetings and a lot of people don't know why, why we're there. Um, but we get a lot of understanding out of understanding how things work and enjoy um, kind of informing those through our knowledge of users. And then viability says, will this solution make the organization successful or allow the organization to be successful? And can they maintain it, continue it, uh, evolve it based on the work um, that's been done for a first iteration of a product? Um, some people say MVP is minimum viable product. A lot of times folks in the design space will say minimum valuable product. And that's what we want organizations, how we want organizations to think about our work on products and especially, um, you know, design as an enabler of business goals. So if we go to the next slide. So this is the design thinking process. This is an introduction to it. We're going to do as a group, Augustine's going to lead us through some more ideation around that. Um, if you look at the bottom of the visual, we have understand, explore, and materialize. So looking at understanding, um, empathize and define, are the things that allow us to discover a solution that solves human problems or enhances human performance. Um, so when we empathize, designers uh, best love going out in the field. And in COVID time, that means zooming into the field. Um, but what we what we do, is we identify um, a target audience um, around a problem that we know exists by talking to users, talking to target users. It's very rare uh, that we can be pure anthropologists that visit, let's say, um, there was on anthropology done at uh, Xerox Park, you know, where they said, here, go here and figure out, um, you know, your research agenda and go out in the world. Um, we work for product organizations. So typically, um, and I'll, I'll use an example, I worked on uh, medical imaging for a while. And so, a question arose as to how do specialists use medical imaging? Um, it's broad, but it's when, within the context of an industry. And that's likely what you'll see. But we're talking to people, asking them to show us how they use their systems, asking them to tell us what keeps them up at night. Um, and first and foremost, you know, how we can make them successful and what does success look like for, for them. We define by um, creating what we call artifacts. And again, Augustine will get into this, but how do we show stepwise how people work? Um, how do we show uh, who they interact with? Um, rarely is there one user. Uh, there's always more people that enable that person's uh, success. And then we take time to ideate. We uh, look at analogous experiences. So medical imaging, we looked at Spotify, for example, and said, what if uh, you could use a Spotify-like interface um, to manage medical images. So that's not uncommon. 
for us to look outside of um, kind of a industry or functional domain uh, to get inspiration. Uh, and then we start prototyping. And this could be in uh, wireframing tools. Uh, we use those in ideation as well. And those are um, tools that behind the scenes generate HTML. Um, you won't ever want to use it in your work, uh, but we can simulate screen layouts as well as interactions, some pretty sophisticated uh, things that after this session, if you're interested in learning more about wireframing and tools we use, we'd be happy to um, talk about those. We won't get that into that today. So we do prototyping, um, could be in a wireframing tool, could be you know HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, and then we test with users. And you'll notice the arrows here, um, there's a lot of fluidity, um, especially if we look at this test and prototype. So just like we think of iterative, systems development, this is iterative systems design. And ideally, this is my favorite way of doing it. It's not everyone's, but I really believe that if design and development are in lockstep with design being a sprint or two ahead, there's continuous learning of both um, disciplines. This is where we really lock arms. And if we've designed something that isn't doable in a time frame, we can quickly prototype an alternative and um, assess feasibility. So it's a continuous desirability, feasibility, viability conversation where the viability is, will I have folks to maintain this is another question, especially in consulting. Um, do we have experts in this platform or how can we uh, create those experts? And then we implement, we, uh, you know, we deliver the system, um, you know, as eight flight, uh, we may just deliver the first version. Uh, we may stay around, we may come back, um, but it's that whole idea of, you know, that now that we're, we've implemented, if you look at design thinking, we go back to saying, how are people living this, with this? You know, where are the pain points and so on? So this is a fluid process. And next slide is Augustine. So take it away. So I will take over. Um, so in this next session, what we're going to be looking at is actually going over step by step um, the last slide. So if we look at here, oops, if we go through empathize, define, IDA, prototype, test, and implement, we're going to be looking at opportunities where there's activities that each side, so design and development, might be doing during those phases and um, looking at where we can collaborate together and um, sort of push it forward and make sure that, as Mary said, we're all lockstep as we go through the process. And this is really important for us at 8th Light. We like working together to maintain um, all three arms of the product design process. We could put questions. Okay. Yes, please put any questions that you have during this. Um, you can speak up and interrupt us, um, especially during this next session, we're gonna be asking for your participation. So looking at software that's built through an iterative and agile process, this should be very familiar to you where going through iterations in order to create something that's better. We're not, we're not trying to create something that's in its final form off the bat. We're looking to make incremental updates and changes based on any information that uh, we're getting during testing. Um, we're able to drive acceptance testing um, and make sure that there's everything that, that's being created is viable. Um, and 
there's there's many things that if Byte does in order to assume that there's pair programming that that I know that the developers do. Um, many designers and developers may pair together around a specific pr uh, problem space. So if there's something that we from the design team need support on, um, Mary gave a really good example earlier, looking at um, if we're diving deep and looking at a taxonomy around the way that like a user account is created um, within a system and making sure that that's flexible. I've actually gone in to you know the back end, looked at the way that everything is set up, and come with, up with other models that I then pressure test with technology teams to make sure that the feasibility is there, the viability is there, and that they're in agreement with us with the recommendations the design team may be coming back from to ensure that we're as informed as possible and we're giving the de development team um, a collaboration space where we can work together to make any recommendations that we come out of the design phase having just more legs and making sure that everyone is rowing in the same direction. So looking at design thinking and agile development, um, you could look at these two things as two separate processes that sort of meet in the middle. We like to think of it as being a little bit more integrated. So while the design team will be largely um, responsible for any design tasks, we do involve the development team in any of our activities, uh, making sure that there's viability, having those collaboration spaces. So there's actually more connections that are happening than just the junction in the middle between the design phase and the agile development phase. We also like being included during any of the development phase in order to test QA. Um, as testing comes up from a technical point of view, if something isn't working, if something uh, needs to change just because of feasibility, there's times where we may, the design team may need to iterate quickly in order to address any issues that are coming up during development. So that's that sort of ebb and flow that happens that Mary was chatting about with having design sprints be about um, you know two weeks or two sprints before development in order to ensure that anything that's being handed off from the design team um, is actionable for the development team. But while things come up um, during the development phase, we're also supporting and helping there. You know, there's that concept around tech debt where you're sort of taking on things and having to fix things that are just ongoing. There also could, you could look at it as design debt. It could be small things that aren't working or aren't as feasible as originally planned. And we're just addressing those things in order to better support uh, the development team. Let me just check the chat to see if there's any questions. Yeah, um, Pauline's asked the question. Um, do you have any examples in the real world that you can speak of? It would be great to see examples. Sure, we don't have anything planned for today with concrete examples, but we can talk through certain things. Was there a specific example that you were looking for, Pauline? Pauline, you're welcome uh, to an... um, oh, great. No, just um, anything really in particular that comes to mind. I can I can provide an example, Augustine. Sure, go ahead. We can we can tag team. Um, so an example where we had the luxury to do the whole design thinking process, we often don't. Um, an example, I'll, I spent, like I said, several years in healthcare and medical imaging. And one example, so if we look at, can you bring the process back up, of course. Augustine? That, yeah. So um, one of the questions that uh, we look we were looking to answer the product management team was looking to answer is how might um, clinical specialists use cloud-based imaging software 
So this would be like you, if you had a CAT scan or an MRI or an X-ray, you would be able to share those met those uh, images, um, you know, cross institutions using a HIPAA compliant cloud. And so um, I led the user research and I changed up the question, which was how do you use medical imaging to deliver patient care? And we went out to several medical institutions like hospitals and interviewed specialists and said, you know, give us a day in the life of how you use medical imaging um, to work with colleagues or to work with patients. Um, and then we brought the results from those interviews and um, kind of watching people use uh, products. We created workflows, which we call journey maps and service blueprints to show um, over a patient's journey, because that's the end user we, who receives the care, uh, what are the high points and low points and who works with who and, and uh, how does imaging facilitate that? Um, and that we brought that information back to the product and development team. And it was hard information for them to hear. Um, and that happens. Uh, designers are really accustomed to that. Um, and in this case, the doctors were, were testing texting images. The specialists were texting images. And you might say, that's terrible. How could they do that? You know, that's personal information. Well, they were trying to save lives. And so it was just really some interesting insights to deliver and to uh, bring to the product and development teams to ideate and prototype around. Um, the system was email-based, um, like an email-based kind of framework. And we learned that different hospitals prioritized texting, some prioritized emailing. So you have this kind of cultural thing that comes out too. So, you, you know, we're empathizing and defining, and then we learn, well, wait a minute. You know, there's this cultural um, kind of agreements happening between how people communicate and also um, how roles are valued. Uh, you know, we learned, oh, the nurses are doing a lot of the work to make the cloud-based infrastructure work, to upload images. Um, and so, then we said, well, um, I guess we need a mobile app. And so we worked with development to look at this email-based model and how we might uh, transform that into a mobile app. And then it was implemented. Um, and throughout the IDA prototype test, we went out to, um, one hospital in particular actually had a design thinking department. And so we'd go out to that hospital and share prototypes with people um, and get their feedback um, in the hospital environment, which, you know, it seems like the world is moving to a place where we can do that again because it's super valuable to be in you know, the emergency room, to be in the hospital room, to be in the physician's office. Pauline, does that help? Oh, there we go. Yes, thank you. You bet. And you're right, Pauline, we do have case studies on our site as well. Great question, thank you.
So on the heels of that, I'm going to pop out of the presentation view. Oh, can I? Yes, I can. What we wanted to do is look at each step in that design phase and talk about what we could be doing and what activities happen. And these, this is semi-filled out. Um, Mary and I went through and just put some top level ideas together. But what we're really looking at here is um, sort of presenting what we're doing during each of these stages and what development could be doing to support any of the design thinking stages to show collaboration space. So during the empathize, the empathize um, step, we're looking at the initial stages of development of product development, and we're focusing on understanding um, the end user of the product or software. So as Mary mentioned, we'll go in and do user research, conduct surveys. Um, we oftentimes are interviewing people, talking to them, shadowing them, where we actually go throughout their day and observe and try to understand what their motivators are, looking at their pain points, um, highs, lows. Um, we'll pull people together that serve similar functions or similar roles within a software and try to understand collectively what they're doing. Really, all of this is about collecting as much information as we can. We're also using technology to do it. So there's a human element where we're talking to people, but um, we're also looking at the footprints in the sand, right? We're looking at analytics, heat maps, um, any piece of sort of te technological information that we can gather. We're also looking at those to better understand what people are doing and where they're going. So does anyone have any thoughts about, um, from your point of view, from a development point of view, what are constructs that the team thinks might be helpful or, you know, if you were on a team, on a project, and you knew that you were pairing with designers that were um, conducting these sorts of activities, what would be development-led sort of um, places that you might start or bring information from? I will look into the, um, sorry, my name is Grace. I'll look into um, the ability in terms of um, disability of the person. Is the person um, visually impaired or uh, if the person ear impaired and how would they be able to benefit from the, uh, from the development all through that they'll be included? So I'll look at EDI. So are you asking if just about accessibility? And yeah, accessibility, to yeah, accessibility, yeah. So if that, if that was one of the primary things that we're looking at, if we found um, that, you know, during our user research, that we found that there was a large percentage of users that were accessing a certain piece of software um, that had visual or auditory impairment, we would then draw that as an insight and recommendation as we get to the defined phase. So if we go back to um, sort of this uh, visualization, right now we're trying to understand what any problem points are. And then as we get into ideation and definition and creating prototypes, those would be things that um, would drive parts of the solution. So if we knew that there was somebody with auditory impairment and or visual impairment, the design would then shift and need to come up with um, many different solutions that we could then test with that population. So you can see everything kind of builds upon the next. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we draw insights and learn things, try to come up with hypotheses and then create, you know, uh, potential solutions around those. And as we test, we actually might go back a step you know we might learn more about the end user learn more about what it, the impairment you know and the accessibility and what those um what the impact of that is in order to help drive the solution and really i think the most important thing to understand with the de design process in terms of development is that what we're trying to do is understand any underlying problems 
and try to address them where we're working out those problems and failing basically earlier so that the end solution that's being developed has a higher rate of being a good solution for a broad set of the users. Nothing will ever be perfect, but in going through those small failures and iterating through problems where we're able to come up with multiple solutions and then test, we're lessening the likelihood of having a product with major bugs or major failures from a user experience and organizational point of view. Tanya, you raised your hand. Yeah, I have a question for development led activities. I'll... Oh, I lost your audio. I it can't muted hear. me. It muted me for no good reason. So I would be thinking about would the experience be different on different types of devices? Would the mobile experience be completely different to desktop? And then tablet always gets lost as well. So what would different experiences be for different devices? In a lot of the solutions that we create, we will design specific layouts for each range in a, in a responsive solution. Um, we tend to think of desktop and mobile being completely different, where tablet most oftentimes ends up being something that is an iteration of the desktop design. Um, so as we go into more of the, the design implementation and what we're testing through wireframes, um, we like to sort of attack those as separate problems. So the we might go in and test for just the mobile interface versus testing for desktop. Oftentimes, they're different use cases. Sometimes, um, especially when working on software, having a fully responsive piece of software that doesn't have a lot of use on mobile, we won't develop something or put a lot of emphasis on the mobile site. So looking at analytics, looking at the way that people use the software drives a lot of the efforts in terms of designer development. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. That's a question as well. Is, um, I, I, I'm just curious on the amount that you tend to see in terms of the usage of mobile. Is that still going up? In past projects, I can only speak from the purview uh, of my purview, and I'm sure that, that Mary has her own experiences, but I've seen an uptick actually in mobile usage across um, most use cases. People are trying to access information more on the go with more people being remote or working from different places. Um, being able to access information on multiple platforms is, I believe, has become more prevalent. Um, and as we sort of help to maintain any of the software and platforms that we're looking at, we're oftentimes going in and doing audits of things in order to to measure our impact and and see if the solution is still um, effective. So uh, I did a, a homepage redesign looking at for a you know Fortune 500 company. And we came in, looked at the analytics, tried to understand who the users were, where they were going, um, where they were coming from, and really used the homepage as a signpost to get them to the information that they were looking for. During that project, um, I did sort of a postmortem. Um, and six months later, after the project had been uh, developed and implemented, we noticed that there was a significant, it was like 40% increase in mobile usage, specifically around iOS. So it, it was, it's, it's interesting. I'm sure that it happens platform per platform, because on the, on the other hand, the product that I'm currently working on, that's an internal tool has like next to no mobile usage. So it just depends on the job that, that, that is being done. Oh, interesting. And you also use the term technical debt, and I've heard that quite a bit. And I wondered, could you could you explain it from your point of view? Because I know there's probably different explanations for it. Sure. A lot of technical debt, you know, as I think as teams are working, product development teams are working on their, their products, there are pieces that you're not able to get to, right? There's um, a certain amount of 
keeping the lights on, modernizing software with best practices. And those best practices change over time. So uh, a query that was written two years ago that is you know, one of the older parts of your software might not be optimized to the same level as newer code and newer best practices that are being used. Um, so that, that's sort of how we refer to tech debt. There's a certain amount of uh, development sprint that might be addressing just basic improvements to the site to ensure that the, you know, the, the piece of software is healthy. Um, similar thing happens with design, where the look and feel, the way that the UI works, um, and the way that you're engaging the user evolves over time. And you might have to go back through and, and change a few things based on what you're learning um, from the user, um, as well as just best practices from a UI standpoint. Okay, thank you. Were there any other questions? No, I don't think there are at the okay. moment. So going through, um, so during this empathy phase, our team is looking through, trying to just really understand who the user is. Um, we're trying to empathize with their point of view, what their day is going through, and then draw all of that information together in order to, to inform any decisions that we're making. Um, from the later phases. So as we move to the next phase, we're going to a definition phase. So we're taking all that information and we're creating hypotheses. We're, we're creating what could be potential solutions. And this is a, a phase that I've seen some developers and designers, oh, designers tend to relish this, is just it's pie in the sky. It's coming up with as much as you can to try to understand how to best engage the user and give them the solutions they need. Um, and oftentimes really simple solutions and what you're presenting to your end user can mean a lot of work from a system or development point of view. Oftentimes the easiest thing that you can implement from a development point of view puts more work on your end user. So that could be source of pain points. When, you know, when you're just trying to get something done and get something out there during an MVP, sometimes things aren't quite as accounted for from the user point of view or might not be as informed um, as the user would like. And those are the, the sort of things that we're looking at as we go into an existing system, taking stock of, of what the users are doing and then coming back with new solutions. Um, during this phase where we're, where we're doing definition, we'll oftentimes have collaborative working sessions. We involve technology, design, business, in order to ensure that everyone's point of view is accounted for and that uh, the process can be as fluid as possible. Um, what we hate doing from our point of view is going off and going through our activities and then reporting back. We don't wanna be a black box. We wanna be you, uh, people that bring people together. We're, we're uh, people that unify the different groups in order to solve problems because we're not wizards. You know, designers are taking in information and we have certain specializations that we're very good at, but most of that is built on the backs of technology, the business, and then our own um, sort of history as designers. Any questions around that concept? I know we, we went over this a little bit, but um, I wanted to at least spend a little bit of time in each of the steps and see if there were any questions or um, offer any recommendations around how to, to best collaborate with designers. Okay. So the next step that we went through was ideating. So this is where we sort of take all, everything that we've, we've heard and we're having sessions, we're creating feature prioritization. So as we come up with ideas, there's often times where you need to figure out in terms of your project what should be worked on. Um, and this is where sometimes you have design sprints that stay a little bit ahead of the development phase. You're coming up with potential solutions, creating uh, wireframes, sketches, things that allow you to do that testing. So, well, a big part of our processes is 
coming up with mental models and solutions that we can show to people. So it's not always a wireframe. It's not always a SaaS, like a, a representation of a SaaS product that, that we're doing. For instance, I had um, users, I think I mentioned this, but there was a user model that's being applied to a CRM that um, I'm currently consulting on. And the way that it's been created is very rigid um, to the point where when you're looking at uh, informa different information, they're actually logging somebody out of one account and moving you into another instead of having sort of a basic account for access that's based on their company email and then appending information and access to that. The reason it's important and the reason that we're looking at things at that level and not just at design is because the technology ended up being a, um, a roadblock to the system working better. So because the user was at a certain level, they were actually weren't able to identify uh, um, data access based on the user. So imagine you're logging into a system and your every query that you're running is running across all tables across all of their clients instead of just looking at the clients that the that one account should have access to. Um, so what we did was we worked sort of on our own to understand what that user was and then come up with ideas around how to remodel that user and understand where there are opportunities for improvement and then present back in, during a, a workshop to, to sort of bulletproof it with the development team. So just want to sort of show examples of where <clears throat> design isn't necessarily just staying in their lane. We're not always just focused on UI. We're looking overall at the product as a system and where there's opportunities for improvement. So whether that's technology or from a business process, um, there can be problems um, across, you know, how design teams are viewed within the, the and how development teams are supported. There can be many different aspects that end up affecting the end product through the work that's being done. Any questions before I keep moving on? No, no questions at the moment. So with prototypes, um, being a visual designer, this to me is one of the most fun things. You know, Mary mentioned that um, there are times where if it's really specific, you might need to make and do like a down and dirty sort of HTML, CSS. You know, I've gone so far as where I uh, need to replicate and show off a certain interaction and I'll export out like a PNG and set a div over it that's a Z-index higher and like throwing in a, a video so that it kind of mimics what an HTML and CSS page does. Um, but oftentimes a lot of the design tools that we're using, we can use to prototype. So if we need to prototype a certain interaction, having things that are draggable, a rollover, the way that a system changes, um, scrolling through tables, sort of kind of basic things, we can now do that through the design software. And what it does is it allows us to create a very immersive prototype that looks and acts much like the end product might look and act. And it helps to, it helps us to draw out insights during testing with end users, but it's also communicating um, sort of end dimensions and colors and type to the development team where we can, we have a, an artifact that's being left behind that we can hand off to the development team and talk through. So if there's a certain system that we have in mind for typography or design language, you know, certain rounded corners, shadows, the way that different levels work, um, those are all things that can be planned for during um, prototyping as well as our UI implementation that ends up being an artifact that that's left behind or uh, it's another, I guess, collaboration space. Many of the tools that we use also offer where on our mockups and wireframes, you can leave comments. So there's um, 
both chances for working sessions or, or pairing together to go through a problem, but we can also send something out and have an asynchronous um, sort of session where people are able to give feedback, voice their worries, voice any red flags. And it's really important for us to get all sides, both from the end user, the business, as well as development, in order to ensure feasibility and viability. Any questions around sort of that topic? Yeah. Okay. So as I said, testing is um, something that's really important. And this often goes in a loop between um, the last stage. So, you know, our prototyping and ideating and testing all sort of happen continuously until we end up with testing having I think enough legs that we feel that things are viable um, and that and then it moves forward but we'll oftentimes um, do a series of tests where I personally like coming up with a script where I'm taking different users through something that's similar and then seeing the range of feedback that we get and it makes it easier to compare the data points um, with the, everything that you're collecting so you might have them do specific tasks. So you present them with an interface and you ask them to, you know, where might you find your profile? Um, where, if you needed to create a new, uh, if you needed to search, where would you click in this interface? And sort of walk them through a couple of different workflows in order to understand if the hypotheses and all of the prototypes that we put together make sense. And if people are getting lost at a certain step, or if they're just not understanding where things are because it's not self-evident, then we know that we have a problem and we go back to the drawing board to address some of the issues. And they can be really minor things. There's times where um, it's just the name of a label. It could be a color. Um, there's small things that can really make a huge difference in a UI. And those are the sort of things that we're trying to uncover. Um, that way, you know, the development phase isn't going through all this work to create uh, a, a beautiful product that is not usable for the end user. Mary, did you have anything to add around um, tests? No, I think you covered it very well. Okay. Um, and then during our last phase here, we have implementation. So with implementation, we're I, I don't have the design led activities in here, but um, most often what we're doing is finalizing the user interface. Um, and then there's a series of, of documentation that we'll often put together when things are ready for development. So um, any supporting structures around interactions, um, typography, if there isn't a design system that's set um, there are times where we'll create things that are artifacts that help the development team to understand the system a little bit better, in addition to all of the uh, prototypes and UI mockups that we've put together. Um, and then from there, it's really about ensuring that, you know, any requirements gathering is happening on the development side and slotting all of those items into your backlog and sprint planning. So that way there's more of a handoff from our side to the development side, but it's an informed handoff where, again, we're not just a black box that's handing something over and expecting miracles. Um, it's really about collaboration throughout the whole process to ensure that we can do everything. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add is often design is pulled in at this phase. Often we don't, you know, have the opportunity to do discovery, ideation, you know, prototyping uh, and testing. So oftentimes we're brought in here to do some mock-ups they're you know they're often called um and so development can code a user interface um however 
that doesn't allow us to look at feasibility uh, very well. Uh, and it may not be and often isn't uh, based on user feedback. Um, so one of the things we as designers and you know, I, I think it's it's wonderful that uh, you invited us to talk more about design is we're educating on how the work we do will result in a better product. You know, it's kind of this life of a defect thing. You know, the more you know up front, the less uh, complaints you might get or, um, you know, calls to support uh, and saving money by uh, reducing uh, those things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we're painting a very um, rose-colored picture with all of the different phases. We're often rushed through one or two of them. Um, we try and include as many as we can to ensure that there is some research and insights that are driving any decisions that we're making. Um, what we don't like as designers is sort of going into solving a problem with one hand tied behind our back, you know, without understanding and empathizing with the end user and understanding all pieces of um, a system. We're oftentimes not able to make as much impact as we um, would like. How do you um, tie in kind of having lots of different kinds of users? Or do you, do you kind of like give, you know, there may be um, different kinds of users, user journeys into a website or? Oftentimes what we'll do is um, do the research to understand each user. And then there's something called the service blueprint where we'll look at user flows for the different users. And if there's an interdependency between those users, it's really illuminating to see the way that they might get their work done um, together and opportunities for collaboration, opportunities for um, focusing their work, focusing any of their views, their access to information, things like that. Um, so to answer your question, holistically, we, we love looking at all the different users and understanding how basically different mental models and how people move through a site. Um, it depends on what the end solution is and the type of software that we're, we're designing. Um, if it's you know, more of a promotional site, we might use somebody that's in a different mental model or wanting a different outcome. Um, if it's more facilitating work, oftentimes it's role-based um, where you're looking at somebody that is a uh, you know, management versus somebody that's doing the work versus somebody that might be um, accessing the tool because of finance or marketing, things like that. We also, um, just to add to that, we also really enjoy finding the interactions between users, um, you know, what they depend upon of each other, what information is passed, um, and understanding how they impact each other's journeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's no other questions at the moment. I don't know whether there's, is there more to the presentation or is that there? No, that was, that was the oh, end. Okay, so it's a chance for questions. Oh, all right, so you've come to the Q&A. So. <laughs> we've come to the Q&A. We, yeah, we've so sort of been doing it a little bit here. Yeah, there, yeah, that's good. Please feel and, free uh, to ask any questions yeah. or raise your hand. Yeah, so people, you know, put um, questions in the chat or um, just let me know if you want to call. Grace out. has raised her hand. Yeah. Oh, great. Grace? Oh, I didn't see. Oh, that's why I'm on the wrong view. Hello. Um, I came a bit late. I just want one question. I appreciate what you are doing, but do you do apprenticeship? And when will you start? Uh, the, the developer apprenticeship? Yeah. Yeah. But um, let me see, which are the type of apprenticeship? Let me go by that. Which are the type of apprenticeship do you have available? Apart from yeah. the developer. 
I think that more information is on our website. Okay. Uh, and I'll find that link and post it. Uh, it looks like Augustine is already um, doing that. Okay. The There's different if classes, if you will, or groups of apprenticeships, apprentices that start together um, at different times throughout the year. And um, you apply to be an apprentice, you interview. Uh, I think then if you're selected, you're assigned mentors. Mm -hmm. And then um, you go through training based on the skills you brought into the company. And then you graduate from the apprenticeship and are assigned to a client. Okay. Um, yeah, so... It's somewhere on our website. I, I at least I not so much. Um, yeah, I so we. Find it, but I know that there is somewhere that it is. Yeah, yeah. Since we don't have the posting at the moment, uh, we pretty much, I, I believe, have made our um, post for the year and have selected individuals for probably what will be the majority of 2023. If that changes, we'll be sure to have that uh, updated on the website. But the best way to save most informed would be to sign up for our talent community so in addition okay. to just like checking out our website and what are our open roles at this very moment um okay. and we actually do have a ux position open right now um but for future opportunities it would be going to that talent community you would be the first to be informed about any other new openings and then uh some time in advance to prepare for the apprenticeship application because it's usually one that gets quite a lot of applicants okay have you um I mean, is that in the past that you've taken a BA? Because my interest is BA. Business, a business analyst. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, that. we're completely open. Um, and we've seen people who are career changers, who have come from even like a QA background, from no tech background, who have maybe gone to a boot camp. So some that haven't. Um, so there are no... Uh, free qualifiers okay. uh, in terms of the apprenticeship. But ideally, the, the process is made to assess the skill set so that we can get a group of folks that we feel prepared uh, to go into that next level of how we hone and groom additional skill sets, right? So we do want some level of background, uh, but that process and the recruitment is meant to kind of assess that. And, you know, in the future, should we grow those aspirations to do the same for a design apprenticeship? I'm sure it would be the same and that we would keep a pretty open um, door to those that could okay. well, qualify um, for an application. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching. I'm just um, changing of career to tech. So we I've been a that. teacher for longer. So <laughs> I love what you said that I had heard when you said that you take on people that are just changing careers and so on like that. And that made me so happy and uh, yeah I would like to be involved thank you Grace I appreciate you saying that and uh, thanks for being here to learn more about not only the design but a flight as well thanks you're welcome thanks for coming too do we have any more questions I, I've got another question actually the um the kind of the process is a lot quite a complex process that you go through um, with lots of parts and um, we we talk a lot about um, agile and you know but one of the things with agile is because it's iterative it's quite hard to kind of keep that overview of the whole project how how do you go about having that overview of the big project or or kind of do you have also do you have some kind of checklist or kind of approach for starting a big project Yeah, uh, I'll give my experience. Um, it's outside a flight, but it's a, a big uh, development effort. And um, using the scaled agile framework, there's a lot of uh, leaders and people who monitor different um, you know, phases, I know it's iterative, but what I've seen is that products still have a date, <laughs> you know, that they want to deliver. And especially yeah. in the medical space, 
there's a lot of testing that needs to happen for uh, approval. Um, I think it's a really difficult thing, however, to maintain kind of the why behind the work. Um, and I think if, if no one is reinforcing that, uh, we become like siloed in our different uh, product deliverables. Um, so the best way I've seen it done is through a product manager, mm -hmm. um, through someone who's thinking about um, putting something out into the market end to end and who sets the stage for the target market um, priorities for the product and consistently um, works with other product managers and technical leaders and ideally design leaders to uh, prioritize, reprioritize the work based on learnings, not only from design, but from development. So I, I think product managers and a roadmap um, and continuous inspection of that through backlog management is the best way I've seen it done. Yeah. Right. Yeah, from my perspective, I would definitely agree with that. It's um, it's almost like a muscle. I think that the more experience that you have and the more projects you've been on, the more that you're used to speaking about business aspects and the project as a whole, viability, feasibility, um, it, especially at the beginning of your career, you're very focused in on what you're delivering and it's harder to sort of take a step back and look because it can get overwhelming. Um, and as you go through your career and have more experience, you can, it's easier to live at both levels. It's easier to delve down into the details and, and you know, deliver what you need to deliver. Um, you know, I have 20 years experience, but I'm still, you know, boots on the ground delivering user interfaces and wireframes and insights and results to our, our clients. Um, but I'm also having very high level conversations with business leaders and um, product owners. So it, it's definitely a, a difficult thing. Thank you. Um, and Ariel's asked Camille, um, could you please share the web link for the US position that you just mentioned? On it, you got it. Great. Are there other questions? Hi, I had a question. Uh, oh. First one is uh, actually related to the uh, uh, job positions. Like, are most of the job positions based out of, uh, you know, like, is it... Uh, Europe, if I'm not wrong, because I understand participants are from different countries, right? So I was interested to know if you guys do offer any remote uh, roles, as if I'm not wrong, some of the positions could be done remotely, I think. Uh, so that was my first question. And the second one is for the internships, like are they mainly focused on development? or like design or is it also including you know testing or like quality analysts um okay i think i can answer both uh, i'm trying to multitask and also put this link in here <laughs> but um at this very moment um we are mainly hiring within the us and there are opportunities to also hire in canada um and that is mainly on the principal crafter side. So that's really more our full stack polyglot developer positions. Um, and then design opportunities uh, are focused currently within the US and potentially Canada as well. Um, I will say that depending on a number of different factors, uh, because we do have UK offices, we are able and we have, and we continue and we will in the future hire more openings and have those available within the UK as well. Um, and so uh, we are fully remote. And so um, while we can support employees that might move to other countries at this very moment, these are the 
areas where we're able to actually recruit to start. Uh, so individuals who have eligibility and who can work in those countries, mainly Canada, US and the UK. Um, and then I think your question was pretty much around um, the apprenticeship. We don't call it an internship, it's an apprenticeship. Um, is really focused on um, developers at this very moment. We call them crafters, uh, but it has a development focus. Um, and there is a lot of enthusiasm, interest, <laughs> and uh, planning that will be done in the future around doing that for the design side of the house. Uh, but it's not yet something that is in fruition. Okay. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. So currently the apprenticeship is focused on, you know, the development or design aspect? On the development, yes. Here's another question in the chat. Um, uh, it's from Kudi and she says, apologies, my question might be um, taking everyone back because I joined late. I didn't quite get if this design process um, has to do with applications, platforms as a service, or application platform as a service. Oh, else she said she said platform service twice. <laughs> so, Goody, the um, the design process that we're we're chatting about today um, applies to all of them. Um, oftentimes we are we can we can actually use this process across things that are bigger than just software. Um, if we're looking at certain processes or business processes, um, we still um, use design thinking in order to understand a problem space and come up with potential solutions and then test against those in order to um, gather insights, recommendations, and provide potential solutions. So it, it, it is, it's a very flexible system. Um, it has its roots in um, physical product design. Uh, we have adapted it towards digital products, but um, it's quite flexible. Uh, thank you so much for, for that um, response. I did want to ask, I also wanted to ask if, um, how do you keep your, um, your products, how do you maintain um, the integrity of your products in the sense that, I think I'm trying to ask about reusability, right? But I don't know how to frame the question well. So, but um, how do you prevent um, user requirements from um, kind of destroying the system totally? Because I know that um, some users can come up with different ideas on how they want the system to function and Sorry about the background noise, my children are just on my neck. So how, <laughs> how do you how do you um how do you prevent users' um, requirements from just um uh, destroying the, the system in total? Because I know that sometimes um based on previous um developments or the previous dev work, you can you can see that um some business rules might be conflicting with the others. So it's like the system just goes into um it just becomes a mess. So how do you prevent that from happening? I don't know if my, my question is clear enough. I, I, I'm understanding your question um, quite clearly. So you're asking, um, you know, as we're gathering requirements and understanding the users more, how do we ensure that, and honestly, sometimes that might be the recommendation and insight is that there might need to be changes to the business processes based on what the end users are looking to achieve. Um, but more succinctly, I think that you have to read between the lines sometimes. Um, users will tell you they want a certain thing, but you have to be really curious and ask them what they're they're really looking for and what they're trying to get out of the system, what job they're, they're trying to accomplish. Um, and in that, you can find um, recommendations and insights towards more intelligent solutions. Um, we don't try to just give everyone what they want. Um, a good product design is not about just making everyone happy. It's about weighing um, what people really need in order to get their jobs done and supporting as many people as we can through that. Uh, Mary, did you have anything to add to that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of hit it with, um, you know, what people say may not be what they do. Um, and also looking at what job they want to do um, and, you know, being goal-based about that, um, I think are two key thoughts you mentioned. Yeah, and, and I haven't had many instances where the business is resistant to their end users' goals. Um, oftentimes when they're bringing us in, at that phase, they want those insights and recommendations. If there is a problem with the business goals and it has a conflict with um, you know, the actions the users are seeking, that often just becomes an insight where we're able to show uh, potential solutions and any impact to uh, a business process if, it, if it's necessary to avoid scope creeping. So yeah. that's... That, that's interesting. Um, oftentimes that ends up being that product manager position that, that uh, Mary was alluding to earlier, where we're coming in with a set of solutions. It's working with product managers and stakeholders in order to set up a roadmap that makes sure that things are feasible. Um, oftentimes we'll come up with a solution that might, you know, its end state might be a year away. So we, um, I tend to, to, to call things a, a crawl, walk, run scenario where, you know, what is our first couple of steps? What can we do over the next three sprints? And then looking farther ahead, what can we do? With the, and, and that helps keep that long-term goal of what the product roadmap is versus what is actually feasible in the shorter term. Thank you so much for your response. That's quite insightful. Um, I one last question. I'm sorry for asking too many already, but one last question I had was um do you do you have like out of the box um uh settings or out of the box um designs that users can tweak to um, suit their own um requirements? Or is it just like it has to be just the way it is? Well, we do, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we do create design systems for clients. Um, you might think of design systems as color, typography, um, the way, you know, buttons look, the way headers look on, on a website. So often that's a deliverable or that's something we deliver to clients. And then you, you might think of our wireframing tools as um, you know, software out of the box that allows us to get a jump start on designing uh, products. Um, and certainly, you know, we work with clients like one one I'm working with. They're testing SDKs for uh, interactive chat. And some of those uh, software products come with their own uh, interface uh, widgets or requirements. So sometimes we work with those as well. Oh. So from your own point of view, what's the um, latest um, programming language or coding language in trend right now that, or that one can just, um, is it JavaScript that you guys use or what, oh, what is, yeah. yeah, what's the major coding um, program yeah. that you guys use right now? We are not coders. <laughs> I don't know if Augustine has a point of view. I mean, we, for what we do for wireframing, Figma is kind of the leading product. We could circle back to you, however, and find out what the latest uh, front-end development languages are, if that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's outside of our purview with, with, with the function that we serve in design. Um, although we're very technical, 
um, and I can pair with many developers, the, the N languages and, and how they're using the code is um, beyond what the kind of integration that we're getting into. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, no more questions from me. So can I, I, come, I came in late too. So can I say that your project is only about product design? uh yes okay okay so that that is um the user i would say um front end yours is front front end you don't deal with the back end from the as the user experience right that's where our focus is okay okay that's your focus okay that's good so for instance for happy a project now that i want to design so if I bring it to you, and then um, we'll be able to turn into a real model that um, um, can be tested among the users before it goes to final implementation. Right, that is a scenario. Okay, okay, all right. I just want to get, because I came in late, and I just oh, want to be here. not at all. That's good, okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, Mary, I think Mary A had your hand. You had your hand up briefly, but I just want to check if you wanted to yeah, ask. Yeah, so question. I had a question. I wanted to ask um, what your day to day looks like when you're working on a product. Um, uh, how like your team members are interacting with each other. Um, so I wanted to know how that how that kind of works. I'm afraid that I need to drop. I am so sorry. Um, yeah, August. To, oh, you do too. But I, 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 I can go ahead and answer that question, and then um, okay. And then, um, my day to day it depends on the phase. So, um, our team is keeping in contact in order to support each other um, as much as possible. Looking at you know best design practices, mental models, activities that we can do with our clients. Um, and then providing any learning and development here at A Flight. Um, I'm interacting with my client in terms of client management, making sure that they understand any work that's being done, tasks that need to happen. Um, then I'm working in Figma or working um, during like holding working sessions. Um, it depends on the phase. You know, there's some parts of the phase where I'm doing. Um, user interviews. So there was a solid two weeks where I was on four to six hours of meetings a day just to understand what users were doing and then synthesize it, digest it, um, and work with um, the team that I'm working with. Um, and then other times, you know, I'm in Figma designing, creating any of the solutions um, that I need to, and then working with the product team um, that I'm embedded with to um, sort of beat up any of the concepts that I'm coming up with. It, it just kind of depends, but it's um, it's a very dynamic way to work, and it's why I've been doing this for so long. It's um, it's just really inspiring getting work, getting to work with so many different types of people, um, both internally at Aflight and with our clients. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Thank you. It, it looks like you need to go now, but um, I, I think we can already see lots of people saying thank you in the uh, chat and, um, you know, this opportunity to kind of really talk to the designers as well about what, what comes before the, the development is has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Well, we appreciate all of your time. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. Um, if you have any follow ups, just let us know. Um, we'd be willing to come back and, you know, speak about any specific topics that are of interest. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. If Thank you. Okay. Augustine, Camille, it's been lovely. Thank you all for being here, spending your Friday evenings for some of you with us. It's been much appreciated. Just a quick reminder that we do have many courses that are open for applications at the moment. And our next in-person event will be in London on April 5th at Makers, and we'll be talking about chat GPT. Everyone, please enjoy the rest of your days. I've been Tanya, that's been Mariam, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Tanya. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you.